enough. Are we alive or are we dead? Well, it's one of the two. <sighs> what are my thoughts on the Polk Negreanu match? Well, Negreanu's behind at the moment. Why did you delete your party poker cash game? I've never had a party poker cash game. Nice try, though. Hope you're all having a wonderful morning. Well, thank you all for being here. Today, we are going to be discussing how to play draws in the Cadillac of poker. No limit Texas variety. Because um, what is more American than driving a Cadillac around Texas? Am I right? All right. So first things first. How good is your draw? You have a good draw or a bad draw, but it's not necessarily even a good draw or a bad draw. You instead want to ask, is this a very strong draw that I'm happy getting all my money in with? An okay draw, like a weak flush draw or open and straight draw. Thomas, you want to say hello? You want to say hello? Okay. Well, there he goes. Or is it a bad draw, like a gut shot or over cards or something like that? If it's a very, very weak draw, it doesn't really have a lot of equity. If it's a medium strength draw, you want to say hello? Like a flush draw has, you know, 35 or 40% equity. Look at that hair on you. You need a haircut. How are you doing? Which way does your hair go? Your hair goes this way. Can you say hello? What's your name? Ah, this is baby Thomas. He loves to play and cause trouble. Yeah, that's my what tea. You want tea? He said, "All right, you're clearly rambunctious. Can you say bye bye?" Bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Nope, that's my. You want a sip of tea? Here you go. Have one sip of tea. Nope. Okay. These are my headphones. All right, bye. Bye. Love you. James is in school, so he's just fumbling around by himself right now. He doesn't know what to do. Okay. How good is your draw? This is very, very important. Next. Does your draw have showdown value? If it checks down, can your draw win? When can your draw check down and win? Well, when it has some marginal made value, right? Typically, ace-high flush draws don't actually want to just be blasting the money in the pot because ace high wins sometimes when it checks down. And very importantly, it's nice to have some draws in both your betting and your checking range. Because if you always bet with all of your flush draws, it means when you check, you don't have a ton of flush draws, right? And if you always check with your flush draws, it means when you bet, you don't have a lot of flush draws. So essentially, you want to make sure that you are playing your range. Hmm. You're playing your range in such a way that your opponents don't know if you clearly have one type of hand or the other, right? So you're going to find that very often with your ace high flush draws and your flush draws with a pair, you don't really want to get a lot of money in. Let's say we are playing really deep stacked. Imagine if we bet, we bet the flop, someone raises, we go all in, they call. Does the fact that you have a pair with your flush draw really matter all that much? Not really, right? Because if you're 100 big blinds deep and your opponent wants to get all of your money in, then they have like a set or two pair to the point that your one bottom pair or whatever doesn't really matter, right? So you're going to find that you don't really want to be blasting it in with those types of hands. In the past, people did, though, because their logic is, oh, I have, you know, 45% equity. You want to get it all in, which, you know, may be true, probably a little bit less than that. But... It also makes your checking range and your calling range substantially weaker, right? So you want to make sure you're protecting your checking range, and that often includes checking your hands that have some showdown value. Is my wife finished? Your son calls her Ati. Our son calls her Amy, because her name is A-M-I-E. Close, though. A-A-I-T-I -I is close to A-M-I-E. No, it sounds very similar. We have two great webinars today. Indeed, we do. If you're a poker coaching member... Check it out, pokercoaching.com in the top right-hand corner of the dashboard. We have a list of all the upcoming webinars. We have two today, so make sure you hop in those later today. Um, next, 
How often do we want to actually be applying aggression? How often do we want to be betting and raising? Sometimes it's a lot, sometimes it's not a lot. Often this depends on do we have the range advantage and do we have the nut advantage? When it comes to check raising from let's say the big blind, there are times where you don't actually want to check raise often at all. That's usually when you are at a big nut disadvantage, meaning you don't really have a whole lot of nut hands in your range and you don't have the range advantage. This is a spot where you want to be doing a whole lot of check calling, which means you don't get to raise with your draws, right? There are other times though where you have the big nut advantage, like let's say it comes seven, six, six, and you're in the big blind, you have a whole lot of sixes, whereas the initial raiser probably doesn't, right? So there you have a lot of nuts, which allows you to check raise with a lot of draws, okay? Next, very important point. You do not want to be playing aggressively with a draw if you would have to fold to a raise. Or assuming that is a bad result, right? If you would be unhappy folding to a raise, like meaning you have a lot of equity and you don't really want to fold it, but that is a possibility if you get raised, you don't want to be playing aggressively with your draw. A very, very clear example of this. Let's say we're playing 40 big blinds deep, okay? 40 big blinds deep with our draw. Let's say we raise. Actually, let's say someone raises, we call from the big blind, okay? Someone raises, we call from the big blind with whatever. Flop comes. We check, they bet three big blinds, we check raise to eight big blinds with our draw. Doesn't matter what it is. Now, if they go all in for 30 big blinds total, we have to put in uh, roughly 30 to win a total of 80. So we need to win about 37.5% of the time to break even. So we don't really want to have draws that have between 35 and 40% equity in this scenario because those draws are gonna be in a rough, roughly break-even scenario and given the pot odds, right? So what draws have about 37.5% equity? Well, we can use Equalab to figure this out. If you're watching on Instagram, I'm showing my screen right now. If you're on Instagram, you can't see it, go to youtube.com slash poker coaching to check this out. Let's say we have a 9-8 offsuit. Let's say we're against, I don't know, let's say we're against pocket aces and let's say the board is seven of clubs, six of diamonds, two of hearts. So we have an open-ended straight draw. Notice here, this draw has about 34% equity, kind of near that 35% break-even point. We don't really want to check raise 9-8 for over cards and open-ended straight draws in this scenario because when we do get it all in, we're in a roughly break-even spot and we have to actually fold. You don't want to fold the 9-8 on 7-6-2. What if we are instead our opponent has a seven? We see then we have 49% uh, equity because our two over cards are good, right? So you see we don't have just like exactly 35% equity. It's actually pretty close to break even spot, right? So like let's say we give our opponent a seven and ace ace just for simplicity. We see there we have 44% equity, roughly that break even spot. We don't really want to be in that scenario. So we don't actually want to be check raising all that often with a hand like nine eight. What if the board is seven of clubs, six of clubs, two of hearts, and we have king, nine of clubs against ace, seven, or pocket aces? You see now, again, 47-ish percent equity. Not really a great spot, because if we're against aces, which is what we're often going to be against in this spot, you see we're at 35% equity again. So we're somewhere between like 35 and 50% equity with king, nine of clubs, two over cards and a flush draw, if your opponent wants to get all of their money in. So you see... Eight and nine out draws in this spot are not really great to get all in with, which is kind of surprising to a lot of people. They think, oh, flush draw, let's just get it all in. But that's not true because if you check raise and get jammed on, you actually are in a very close to break even scenario and you want to avoid roughly break even scenarios. So knowing that, knowing that, what draws should you be looking to raise in this spot? Let's say someone raises, you call the big blind, it comes 762, two clubs. What should we be check raising here? Well, we want to check raise our nut hands, pocket sevens, pocket sixes, pocket twos. Maybe not even seven, pocket sevens. Seven six for sure. If we had slow played aces, probably want to get that into. Same thing with like pocket kings if we had it. Um, but then what else? What are our draws here? Well, the draws we want to get in with are either the really high equity draws, that's going to be something like nine of clubs, eight of clubs. 
knows against pocket aces, 9-8 of clubs has 54% equity, right? So even though we have no overcards to the aces, we have the open-ended straight draw to go with it. That's a very premium draw that doesn't mind getting it in. Also, 9-8 of clubs completely lacks showdown value, right? Which means it's a really good hand to check raise, because if we check raise and they fold, that's fantastic. What about um, 10 of clubs, 9 of clubs for gut shot? Well, 10 of clubs, 9 of clubs for a gut shot. Sorry, I'm not showing you the screen. 10 9 of clubs has 44% equity against aces, which is good. You can get that in because you're usually going to be in pretty good shape. Same thing with um, 10 8 of clubs, right? What about 5-4 uh, of clubs? 5-4 of clubs, 54% equity. Very, very high, right? So you see that in that scenario, if you check raise with a hand like gut shot or open into straight draw with a flush draw, you can happily call it off because you need to win 37.5% of the time based on the pot odds, but you're going to win like 50% of the time, right? So that's fine. What else should you be check raising though? Because notice there aren't actually a ton of very premium flush draws. Someone said, what about king queen of clubs? Well, how does king queen of clubs do against pocket aces? Turns out not very well. Actually does pretty poorly. The ace high and the king high flush draws don't especially want to be check raising in this spot because if you get jammed on, it's a pretty miserable scenario to be in. You probably have to call it off with King Queen of Clubs, but it's roughly break even. You have to realize the hands that your opponents are betting and then ripping it in with are very, very strong, which means that the overcard value for any of these hands don't really matter all that much. Like give your opponent Ace of Clubs, King of Clubs, right? Not flush draw with the best two overcards. Against pocket aces, you still see only 36% equity. Now, obviously, if your opponent has pocket queens, it gets way better, right? But you don't know what you're against. So, you know, like it's, the thing is, it's fine, fine. It's fine to get it all in with ace, king of clubs for the nut flush draw and two over cards and uh, flush draw, right? It's fine to get it in there. But understand that that leaves your check calling range very weak. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to check call this ace, king of clubs if you had it? That could be the best hand on 762. That'd be great to be able to check call it because then you have some nut flushes in your range whenever the flush card comes. Also, your ace-king high probably wins if you call one bet and then it checks down, right? Um, whereas with like nine high, nine eight on seven six two, if we check call and then we miss, then we have nine high out of position. It's not really where you want to be. Can we discuss if we check raise and our opponent calls and the turn's a blank? Keep betting. Why are we going to continue betting on the turn with our nine eight of clubs? Because it has a lot of equity. Let's say the turn is a three of diamonds, right? Terrible card for a nine, eight of clubs. Nine of clubs, eight of clubs. You see against pocket aces, we still have 33% equity, which is a lot. Also couple this with the fact that we also have six, six in our range. You see now we just have like infinite equity, right? If we have pocket sixes and nine, eight of clubs. I mean, in reality, what does our check raising range look like that we're gonna keep betting here? Let's just try to be really, really honest. Uh, nine, what was the board? Let's see, board was nine, uh, seven, six, two. So we have pocket twos. Do we have six, two suited? Probably not. Seven, two suited? Probably not, although we may. So if our range is like exactly this, let's do suit selection here for the clubs. Um, you see if this is exactly our range and the turn is a blank, you see we have a whopping 80% equity with our range. Why? Because we have a lot of premium hands. Let's say we don't check raise sevens and sixes, which, you know, maybe you don't, maybe you do, because they're really, really good. You see here, we still have tons of equity, 74% equity, and these are all hands we're going to keep betting the turn with. So in this spot, we have a few, actually, we have five, four clubs too, uh, seven, six. So yeah, let me put in five, four, and four, three, and five, three. I'll put in all of those. So we're just going to give us like as many reasonable flush draws as I think we could have that make logical sense to check raise. You see, now we have 71% equity, right? 71% equity is a lot. Like a lot, a lot. So that's great. I want to make it clear, though. Whoops. That's not the right screen. I want to make it clear that we're not only check raising with the premium draws and the nut hands on the boards. We're also going to check raise with our low equity draws. Why check raise with our low equity draws? Because. If we check raise our low equity draws, like let's say um, on Jack six or seven six two, what is a low equity draw? Let's say um, Ace five of hearts, right? Maybe not even Ace five of hearts. Let's do a uh, King five of hearts. 
This is a backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draw. You see against aces on the flop, this hand has only 9% equity. Nine. Not a lot, right? So if I check raise this and my opponent goes all in, we have an easy fold. No problem, right? What if we have um, just a gut shot? Let's say we have 10 of hearts, nine of diamonds, two over cards and a gut shot. We have 18% equity. If I get check shoved on, nowhere near 37.5% equity that I need, so we can easily fold, right? So in this scenario, when we check raise the flop, we are going to be check raising with the nut hands that are happy getting it all in, premium draws that have loads of equity that we're happy getting it all in with, and then some junky draws that we think are not quite good enough to check call. In reality, 10-9 on this board is probably good enough to check call. What about like 8-4 um, of hearts, right? 8 of hearts, 4 of hearts for one over card, gut shot, backdoor flush draw. 22% equity. I think that's probably a reasonable hand to check raise. What if it was nine of spades, eight of, eight of spades, four of spades? That's probably a better one because it would have less equity, right? So I think eight, four of spades would be pretty solid to check raise here. So as you see, we're check raising hands that lack showdown value, that also have some equity to improve to the nuts, but not a ton. So then the question becomes, if we do check raise with these low equity hands and we miss on the turn, what do we do? Well, assuming we have eight, four of spades and the turn is just a complete blank for us, like a jack of diamonds, we're going to check fold. As you're check folding, though, with more of your junky draws, you need to consider slow playing some of your check raised nut hands. Like, say we did check raise with um, pocket sixes and the turn's the jack of diamonds, and I know I have some eight, four of spades and, you know, whatever, hands like that that just completely miss that I want to check fold with, then we need to um, also check with some premium hands so we're not just always checking and then folding, right? So you want to make sure you're structuring your range well. I actually discussed this thoroughly in my tournament masterclass we just released. You can check that out at pokercoaching.com slash cyberweek to get a big discount. Peter says, if the board is 762 rainbow, are we check raising 98? It depends on the stack size, Peter. That's exactly what we're discussing here. Remember, we're discussing 40 big blinds deep. This is a tricky stack size to play, which is why I'm focusing on it today. And if you check raise 9-8 and then get jammed on, you're going to win about 37% of the time. And you need about 37% equity, which is not good. You don't want a break-even spot. You want profitable spots. So you want to either be check raising with very premium draws that can easily call or check raising very junky draws that can easily fold. Whereas 9-8 on 762 is not a draw that you want to fold. And it's also not a super premium draw. So that's not really a hand you want to be check raising 40 big blinds deep. If we were 100 big blinds deep, though, it'd be very different. Now you're going to want to check raise more of your higher equity draws. Because if you do get re-raised, say you make it 8, they make it 23, you can still realistically call 15 to try to win 50 and then proceed to the turn. Because if you do get there on the turn, you stand a decent chance to um, get paid off pretty well on the river, right? So... Understand that we are discussing very specifically 40 big blind stacks. It's important to understand that, especially when you're playing poker tournaments, you need to be hyper aware of stack depths. So I mentioned earlier, does this apply 20 big blinds deep? Well, think about this. 20 big blinds deep. Someone min raises, we call, we check the flop, they bet two or three big blinds, we raise this five or six or seven. At that point, we already have 35% of our stack in, which is not really ideal. We're not doing a ton of bluffing there. Um... I don't mind using that size, I want to make it clear. It is fine to use that size with some premium hands, premium draws, and junky draws. Um, if we do check raise, though, in that scenario, and get jammed on, we have a very easy call, right? Because let's say on this uh, 762 board we have, whatever, junky flush draw, king of clubs, three of clubs, right? Pretty bad draw here. See, we have 35% equity, and at that point, we have to put in um, 13 to try to win 40. Not so good at math on the fly. What's 13 divided by 40? 13 divided by 40 equals 32%. And you see we're 35%, right? Against aces. The opponent's not always going to have aces, right? At 20 big blinds deep, do we raise fold anything? Yes, absolutely. This is a big mistake that I used to make and something everyone used to make. If you check raise with, um, let's say, 8-4 spades again. 
Eight of spades, four of spades. We check raise small with eight four of spades and get jammed on. We need to win 32% of the time, but we're only going to win 20%. Eight four of spades is a great hand to check raise here because if we get jammed on, we can easily fold. And if we get, um, if our opponent folds, that's great. And if they call, we'll probably end up giving up with that hand. And essentially, check raising small allows you to check raise with more junky draws because you don't want to check raise all in with eight four of spades on seven six two, right? That's that's pretty rough, right? You three bet and get called. What's your plan? What do you mean by three bet? This is a two bet on the flop. Our opponent made the first bet. We are raising. Okay. <sighs> Let's see. Yakov's asking me some random hand question. You have 10 big blinds with no chips. The button raises and you go all into fives. Is that fine? Yeah, of course that's fine. It's definitely fine. What makes 58% the number where you go from moderate range advantage to strong range advantage? That's just a good um, number based on how the solver plays. It turns out it starts doing a whole lot more betting whenever your equity is something like 58% or more. There's no, I mean, maybe there's some GTO principle there, but essentially I've looked at a lot of solver images <laughs> and it turns out when you have 58% equity or more, you typically start doing a whole lot of betting. Whereas when you have less than 58% equity, you start doing a decent amount of checking. And then when you have like 52% equity or less, you do a whole lot of checking. This is from the Tournament Masterclass, by the way. Let's actually discuss Tournament Masterclass real, real quick while I have all of you here. Um, this concept we're actually discussing today, the idea of how you play your draws and which draws to raise, is not exactly something that is very clearly discussed in this Masterclass because I don't think of poker in terms of how do I play my draws. I'm thinking more of how do I play my entire range very, 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 very important. You want to ask, how do I play my entire range? Because like we discussed here, if you are not check raising very often at all, then you don't really want to check raise with your draws, right? And as you see here, all of this is in this tournament course. It's 180 parts long. It's a pretty long course, about 30 hours of um, sort of like a presentation content and examples, and then another 15 or 20 hours of um, like in play examples, like hand history reviews, live play, etc. But you see here, this section on when you're facing a bet is quite big, right? Also, we discussed when you're facing a check raise. So how to once like what hands are you check raising? Which hands are you defending with once you get check raised? And this is a, a difficult spot because there are scenarios where sometimes we check raise frequently. Right? Like I said earlier, when you have the nut advantage, you check raise frequently, which allows you to check raise with a lot of draws. If you check raise infrequently, though, you don't check raise with many draws or any draws at all. So the idea of how do I play my draws is kind of a basic way to think about this. I mean, this is a question that one of you asked me to cover, which is why I covered it today. But I want to make it clear that you're not always thinking, how do I play my draws? Or how do I play my, play my top pair on the flop? Or how do I play my ace-king when I miss in a three-bet pot, right? That's not the way you should be thinking about poker. You're thinking way too specifically about your individual hand. Whereas the way you crush poker is by thinking about your tournament. All right. All right. YouTube.com slash poker coaching should be live. All right. All right. Let me get that restream chat back up. Any chance? Boom, skill game. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Everything's coming back together. Everything's coming back. Everything's coming back, everyone. We are finally almost back. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. My kid Thomas is cute. Yes, he is. The kid Thomas is cute. It works now. I don't know what happened. It's like the internet just died. Playing the Hard Rock. Tampa Winter Open today. Good luck. Enjoy it. Stop messing about. Yes, indeed. Sometimes I mess about. Shane says, hype. Hype, hype, indeed. Hype, hype, indeed. If you're holding a premium pocket pair and want to pump up the pot, 
Sometimes flat and try to trap other players. Sure. Do whatever you want. Someone asked me the other day, like, is it okay to make any play exploitatively? I think we were talking about leading. They say, well, sometimes I lead to try to exploit my opponents. You have to understand, if you're trying to exploit your opponents and what they do wrong, you can, in theory, justify almost anything, right? Like, say you're on the river with the second nuts, and you bet and your opponent raises. Can you fold the second nuts? Sure, if your opponent doesn't bluff. But do they not bluff? Well, some people will, some people won't. Thank you all for putting up with the technical issues today. I have no clue what happened. I think the internet just died for like five minutes. Sometimes the internet dies, everyone. Sometimes the internet just dies. Can't do anything about that. Get on the other internet and run it. That's what we're doing here. What in the world just happened to all the, that Twitch thing that someone just posted? The, the, the scary thing is, is like whenever the internet dies one time, uh, you're like, oh my God, is it broken again? But yeah, so you have to be careful with the idea of can I make this play exploitatively? Because you can pretty much justify anything and you don't want to get in the habit of trying to justify why you are doing something. And instead you want to be trying to ask, for the most part, why is the thing that I'm doing potentially bad and what holes or what flaws could there be in that strategy? So essentially, try to figure out why the things you're doing in life will fail or what is wrong about them, right? So instead of trying to figure out why your play is good, figure out what could potentially go wrong. And like, for example, exploitatively leading, the person said, yeah, I just always lead with bottom set and middle set, which, you know, could be fine. What could go wrong with that? Well, your opponents could just fold and never get to continuation of that bluff, right? That's pretty bad. And um, you have to be careful with that kind of thing. Are we live again? I don't know, man. We're in the Matrix. It's Cyber Week, right? You have to understand, on Cyber Week, everything uh, gets a little bit funny. We don't know who took the red pill and the blue pill, and we get all confused. Did I mention it's Cyber Week? We're having a Cyber Week sale. Might as well talk about this while we're here, huh? Lots and lots and lots of poker coaching content is on sale, including the Cash Game Masterclass. Also, we just released the Tournament Masterclass with all of these topics. There's 180 parts of the PowerPoint presentation with quizzes after the vast majority of them. Also, we have all these hand history reviews. These are all tournaments that I've played and got around to reviewing over the last few months. $50 online tournament win. Another $50 online tournament win, $100, $150 online tournament second place, $630 win, high stakes, $1,000 third, third place, $1,000 PKO second place, three satellite wins, and I played an entire Sunday session stream. Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't streaming it when I did this, but I just recorded my thoughts throughout the entire thing. So um, all of that is included in Poker Coaching Premium. Here we have my student, Blas Zerjal, talking about how Poker coaching laid solid foundations that have helped him excel at the game. He's absolutely crushing it. He's cashed for $2.4 million over the last two years. It's pretty good. It's better than me. <laughs> also, we have loads and loads of quizzes, over a 1,000 of them. Very, very interactive where we ask you how you play specific spots in hands. You get feedback from our coaches. Here you see our coaches. Over $50 million in live tournament earnings. We also just added Tommy Angelo. I know some of you are Tommy Angelo fans. We added a brand new coach last night. Tommy Angelo's first stream was last night. It was excellent. So make sure you check that out if you are a member. As you can see here, our coaches, we have just to highlight a few. We have me. I wake up every morning and talk to you all. We have Faraz Jaka. He was the WPT Player of the Year. I was WPT Player of the Year. Can you see that giant trophy at the top? That spiky one? You get that if you win Player of the Year. Well, at least that's what you used to get. Who knows what you get now? I remember a few years after I won, they gave away a $50,000 value poker table to the winner. I got a trophy. We have Burt Stevens, number one online player in the world a year or two ago. Brad Wilson, brand new cash game coach we recently added. Uh, Michael Acevedo, he wrote the book, Modern Poker Theory. Very good book. Groundbreaking. This has become the high stakes Bible for the high stakes poker players. They all love it. Excellent, excellent book. I helped compile this. It was a lot of work, a lot of effort, but I'm glad it's here. Here of that book. 
Now people are trying to call me on my phone. Anyway, lots and lots and lots of great content at pokercoaching.com. And as a thought experiment, since we're in the matrix, ask yourself, ask yourself, what would it be worth it? What would it be worth if you could win one extra big pot every session instead of losing it? What's that actually worth to you? To some people, it's worth a lot. To some people, it's not worth a whole lot. If you play poker frequently, at small or medium stakes, winning one extra big pot could be worth, I don't know, 50 bucks a day, 100 bucks a day. Imagine the educational content we all give, we give you at PokerCoaching.com helps you win one extra big pot per session. Just one, just one. 50 bucks a day, let's say. Let's say you play um, three days a week. It's 150 bucks a week that you would make if you're playing small stakes games and we help you capture that extra $50. 150 bucks a week you'll be making. Hypothetical, of course. If you're playing high stakes, it may win you $500 a session or $200 a session, right? Also, how much would you pay to get content and access to these coaches? These coaches host live interactive classes, kind of like this, where it's a small group of people there and you can ask them your questions in real time. What is it worth to have direct access to some of the best poker players in the world who are actively doing their best to help you succeed at poker. What is that worth? I mean, goodness gracious. Could you imagine the value of having your poker questions answered by the crushers in real time? It's worth a lot, right? Well, anyway, that's what we're offering at pokercoaching.com. Um, we are giving a big sale on Poker Coaching Premium Get for Cyber Week. This will be over pretty soon, so you might as well hop in and get it now. PokerCoaching.com slash CyberWeek. That includes complete access to my Cash Game Masterclass, my brand new Tournament Masterclass. We have a 30-day tournament preparation challenge where every day we give you some content to go through that will help you improve your tournament skills. We also have a 14-day Cash Game Challenge. So all of that is um, available for Poker Coaching Premium members. Also, want me to spoil something we're doing coming up soon? We are going to be giving away $5,000 in cash to Poker Coaching members in December. It's going to be a holiday, holiday giveaway, bankroll refresher. We're just going to be giving it away. $500 to 10 different poker coaching members are going to get it. So if you're a poker coaching member, make sure you log in during that time. Make sure you're using the site because if you log in and use the site, you will automatically be entered into that giveaway. And 10 lucky members will be getting 500 bucks in cash. Did you say cash? Well, call it money for your poker bankroll. It'll be sent to you via PayPal. So anyway, all of that is there. Make sure you get into Poker Coaching Premium. I'm telling you, look, I made this site to be the site that I wish I had when I was starting to play poker and also the site that I want today. I'm going to tell you all a little secret. Half of these coaches or so I know are world-class players and world-class coaches who are absolutely crushing it. They've coached many, many players. I mean, look at Alex Fitzgerald here, right? He's coached more people than I have, and the vast majority of them are still succeeding today. Um, but then we have some of the, these other players who are like literally the best poker players in the world. James Romero, right here, may be one of the absolute best poker players in the world. When I, I mean like top 10. I mean, he was a top 10 live tournament player pre-COVID. And um, we have Burt Stevens here also, literally number one online tournament player in the world. I'm hiring the absolute best people. We have Brad Wilson here who crushes high stakes cash games live and online, making content for you. I am hiring people who I want to learn from. I am a student of the game. I'm not all that great at poker naturally. I want to make that clear. I know some of you may think I'm some sort of savant or something, but I'm really not. I'm good at sitting down and putting in the work and studying. And then I'm also good at compiling that information and giving it to all of you. But I want to learn from these players. And if I can share the learnings that I learned from them with you, then um, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so if you don't like anything in poker coaching, by the way, if you sign up and you think this is just not for me, within 30 days, ask us for a refund. It will give you a 100% refund, full refund. We're not like the other sites out there that charge you a ton of money up front for six or eight hours of content. And then if you don't like it, they won't give you a refund. That's not how we operate. If you don't like poker coaching, let us know within 30 days, we'll give you a 100% refund, okay? Also, something you all may not be aware of. I spend a bunch of money on poker coaching. 
<laughs> so far, since we launched Poker Coaching Premium, I've spent over $200,000 of my money to hire these coaches so that you don't have to. I spent a lot of money on private coaching for myself, and now I'm sort of um, sharing it, right? I'm taking all of this cost that I have uh, I incur and... Um, you know, helping you all, whenever you sign up, you help me pay for all of that so that we can continue helping other people get better at poker. And every month, we continue spending mid five figures, 25, 30,000 bucks every single month on content. I know you all think that um, by the very, very high quality of this production, that YouTube pays me to be here, but um, you'd be wrong. YouTube does not pay me to be here. My source of income is from the poker table and from uh, right on the other side of this uh, this uh, camera here. So if you like all this content, throw us a little bit of support. I'd appreciate it. So anyway, check it out, pokercoaching.com slash cyberweek. As you see here, you can get three years of poker coaching premium. I know 1,499 bucks sounds like a lot for three years worth of content, but if you break it down, it's 42 bucks a month, about $1.35 per day. A dollar and thirty five cents per day for poker coaching premium. Access to all of this. It's a heck of a value. You're not a studious person. What do you suggest? I suggest you get in the 30 day cash game challenge or the 30 day or the 14 day tournament challenge and um, do that. That will give you a very, very structured way to go about learning, right? All right, all right, all right. Let's see. I'm not all that good at poker, says two-time WPT champion. I mean, look, to be fair, when I first started playing poker, I was a weak, tight knit, right? My natural style was terrible. But I studied. I worked hard. I found people who were better than me, and I learned from them, right? And that allowed me to improve my skills. I'm not making my plays because I'm some sort of genius. I'm making my plays because I learned how to play well from other people. And that's what we are actively doing. I am hiring all of these world-class poker players and coaches to help all of you. Are those live interactive classes available for standard members or just premium? It's a bit of a mix. Some of them are available for premium members. Some of them are available for standard members. We have a standard membership as well. It's a little bit cheaper. It includes not as much content. Because, I mean, in reality, if you're not devoting lots of effort and resources to studying poker. You got to also presume you're not spending nearly as nearly enough or nearly as much time as a substantially more person who is dedicated to getting good at poker to study. So there's plenty of content there for you if you are a standard member, but I'm telling you, if you want to really take your game to the next level, premium is probably what you want to get into. What tips can I give you for getting the fear out of your game? How do you not play like a nit? It's a tough question. Understand that whenever you're playing poker, you're not playing for money. You're playing for big blinds, right? Realize that whenever you're playing any sort of game, if you make a play that is not the best play, you're giving your big blinds away. So whenever you make a nitty play, which you think is bad, suboptimal, you're giving your money to your opponents. You really want to give your money away? You worked hard for your money, right? I remember whenever I first started playing poker, I worked at the airport. I would work long, long, long um, work shifts. I'd make the money. I'd put it online, or I'd go play a small stakes local game. And I didn't want to lose that money. I worked hard for my money, right? Even today, I work hard for my money. I'm not trying to give it away. And if you make plays that are not the best play, or the play that you know that is the best play, you are giving your money to your opponents. Simple as that. Do you want to give your money away? The answer is probably no, <laughs> right? So anytime you make the nitty play, you're giving your money away. Also, if you are kind of um, nitty in general, you may find that that may actually be good for your game, right? If you're playing against lunatics, nitty play may be fine. Um, that said, most of the time when people are nitty, either they don't fully understand how to play well, they think they do, but they don't really. Also, they are often playing too big for their bankroll, if you have $200 to your name and you buy in for $50 of it, you have 25% of your money on the table. I would be a nervous wreck if I had 25% of my money on the table. Not because it'd be a lot of money, but because you got 25% of your money on at risk, right? So you want to make sure you don't risk 25% of your money at a time. 
clearly. Check out jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll for bankroll information. But if you're playing under bankroll, that will also lead to you being kind of nitty. And also, if you're just kind of like new to the game, a lot of people who are new to the game or who they, they highly value money because people view money, people, when I say people, I mean non-poker players, view money as something that should be hoarded and then spent on stuff to survive, right? Whereas poker players view their bankroll as a tool that you use and something that you're actively trying to grow. So it's, it's sort of a different thought process when it comes to money in general. And you realize sometimes you're going to lose your bankroll. Sometimes, Well, not your whole bankroll. Sometimes you're going to lose money from your bankroll, right? You have to be nervous when your grocery money is on the table. <laughs> Very true, right? An experience with playing overrolled. Uh, yeah, I was very lucky that whenever I used to play sit and goes back in the day, I had about two hundred thousand dollars in my bankroll, and I was playing two hundred dollar buy-in sit and go. So I had a thousand buy-ins. It's fine, right? I think it's okay to be overrolled. Just realize, like, take that money, invest it in stuff, ideally liquid assets, so you can cash it out if you need to. Um, this is especially the case, like, once you get to the higher stakes. Like, sometimes you just can't play any higher. <laughs> so, like, what are you gonna do? Um, that said, if you're playing tiny stakes, you should probably move up because you'd rather make more money. That said, if you found that you can beat one stake but not the higher stake, and you've put in substantial volume and you just realize, all right, this game's too tough for me, maybe you've reached your ceiling. That said, if your ceiling is $10 no limit, uh, you can probably do better. Okay? If you're not nervous to lose money, you're just comfortable. Understand that comfort is for fish. Do things to get out of your comfort zone. Every winter, I love it. I get outside and I go outside in shorts and a t-shirt and I uh, roll around in the snow and it's freezing cold and it's uncomfortable and you feel like you're about to die. Go for a two mile walk in a blizzard with no clothes on and you're gonna feel like you're about to die. Maybe you are about to die, I'm not sure. I do that every single year, whenever I have the opportunity. And it reminds you, it's okay to be uncomfortable. I take cold showers every morning. They wake you up, but they also remind you, sometimes things are gonna be tough and that's okay. It's okay to have a difficult time. Enjoy it, right? If you're okay in the bad times, you're going to be okay all the time, right? So anyway, that's going to be it for today. Hope you enjoyed this show. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned a lot about how to play draws. If you missed the discussion about draws, it was a good one. You want to make sure you know how to play draws well. If you're consistently screwing up how your draws, you're going to be leaving a ton of equity on the table. Again, if you want a lot more educational content, including how to play draws in cash games, and in tournaments, remember, well, you get access to all this stuff in Poker Coaching Premium. Also, we have the Cash Game Masterclass, right? 29 lessons long. We discuss how to play draws there a ton. Also, in the Tournament Masterclass, we discuss how to play that all as well. So check it out, pokercoaching.com slash cyberweek. And like I said, if you sign up and you feel like you don't like it, ask for a refund. If I don't help you, Get substantially better at poker. I do not want or deserve your money. I want to help you all. That's the goal. I do my absolute best to, but if you think I fail at that, well, such is life, and uh, you get a refund. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Make the most of it. We're right in the middle of the week. It's work time, grind time. I have a lot to do today. Um, something I'm doing for Poker Coaching Premium members currently is I'm going through hands. If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, you can send me a hand history, and I'll review it. I have about 10 or 15 of those to knock out today, so I'm going to be doing that for the Poker Coaching Premium members. Everything's so confusing right now. Listen, Joko Moko, check out the Mastering the Fundamentals course. I think it's it. What is that? PokerCoaching.com slash fundamentals. Does that sound right? Go to PokerCoaching.com slash fundamentals. Completely free course that will get you up to speed on the basics. And once you've gone through that, go through either the Cash Game or the Tournament Masterclass based on the game that you play. If you like this show today, please do me a little favor. It'll take you like half a second. Take your mouse, navigate to the like button, and click like. If there's a subscribe button or a follow button or whatever, click those too. There are notification buttons on Twitch and YouTube you can click that will let you know whenever I'm live and uh, you won't miss a show. So that's it for today. Oh, also, there's a study session coming up right now. We have a poker coaching study session for all poker coaching members. Go to the community tab, get into our Discord group. We have a vibrant Discord community. We have a free study session that takes place Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern time. It happens right after this show. It's ran by our poker coaching member, Louis Fleep. He does an amazing job with that. Thanks to all the members who help with that and um, all work hard to progress together. I hear my kids screaming, so I'm going to go take care of them.
but you didn't know I had a Discord, go to the community tab. We do all sorts of stuff for the Poker Coaching members. Like I said, we're giving away 5,000 bucks in December to Poker Coaching members. 500 bucks at a time is a bankroll refiller. We will sporadically back poker players in tournaments. We were doing more of that pre-COVID. Whenever live poker comes back, we'll definitely be doing more of that. Um, but check out the community tab in Poker Coaching. We have a vibrant community of poker coaching students who are working hard to improve their skills. And many of them are absolutely crushing it. A lot of them are coming out of Louis Philippe's study group. So make sure you check out the study group that happens in five minutes. All right. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Click the like and subscribe button. Check out pokercoaching.com slash cyberweek. Sales almost over. If you want good prices on poker coaching, now's the time. I'll talk to you all again on Friday. Bye-bye. Actually, no. I'm not going to be here on Friday. I have a doctor's appointment. I'll be back again on Monday. But I'll see you bright and early Monday. Um, if you're a poker coaching member, like we said, there are webinars today. All throughout the week. We do webinars all the time. You all know that. Top right-hand corner of the um, dashboard lists all of the content that all of the coaches are putting on for you. Today, I think we have um, Jonathan Jaffe. Literally one of the best tournament players in the world and great cash game player too. And Matt Affleck, both presenting live webinars for the Poker Coaching Premium members. So check that out. I do my best to give you all the content I possibly can to help you improve your skills. Hope you enjoy it. I'll talk to you all later.